this cable generates heat and I'm going to show you how it works and why we need them in this video, which is kindly sponsored by Danfoss Climate Solutions. For 80 years, Devi Electric Heating Solutions have been improving people's quality of living. With electricity emerging as a source of renewable energy, it's enabling electric heating as a sustainable choice for the future. See the specifications for their entire range by using the link in the video description. Do check that out, links down below. All electrical cables generate some heat. Electronic components also generate heat. That's how the electrical energy leaves the circuit and causes our energy meter to measure energy consumption. Generally, this heat is wasted energy. We don't want this in our circuits or in our electrical distribution systems, and we often need additional cooling to remove this unwanted heat from our devices. Otherwise, they will break. However, it's sometimes very useful. For example, in underfloor heating, where the wire generates heat to warm our homes. We can easily turn it on and off, and the heat is distributed throughout the room, not just along one wall like a radiator. When we pass electrical current through a circuit, the electrons will collide with atoms in the wire and the electronic components, and these collisions convert the kinetic energy into heat. Some wires, like this standard copper one, generates very small amounts of heat. But this nichrome wire produces a lot of heat. This is an alloy, meaning a mixture of materials. And this has been specially designed to produce very, very high temperatures. It gets so hot that it even glows. That's also how old incandescent lamps work. The material gets so hot, it glows, and the lamp produces a lot of heat. The heat generated depends on the resistance of the material used, as well as the amount of current passed through the wire, and also the amount of time that the current is allowed to pass through the wire. Some materials will have a high resistance, and some will have a low resistance. This is basically just a measurement of how easily an electron can pass through it without colliding. High resistance means there's a lot of collisions, and so there will be a lot of heat generated. The thickness and the length of a wire affects the resistance. Short, thick wires have less resistance than long, thin wires. That's why distribution cables are thick, to reduce the resistance and energy losses. For example, this heating mat covers one square meter, and it contains around 13 meters of cable. The cable has a resistance of 246 ohms. If we connected this to a 230 volt supply, the current demand will be roughly 0.935 amps. The power demand is therefore 215 watts, or 0.215 kilowatts. So if we ran this for five hours, it would produce 1.07 kilowatt hours of heat and so we would pay for 1.07 kilowatt hours of electricity. Electric heating is used everywhere, from kettles, toasters, hair dryers, electric showers, fan heaters, underfloor heating, frost protection, and so many other applications. We'll have a look at the different types and how they work, but first, where have you seen electric heating used and why? Let me know in the comment section down below. The reason electric heating is so popular is that it's very quick and easy to install compared to steam or hot water systems. There's no risk of leaks and water damage. We can easily shape it to fit our applications. It's almost 100% energy efficient. And when powered by renewable energy sources, it has almost zero carbon emissions. So how are they used? Well, we saw earlier that we can use this nichrome wire to generate heat. That's exactly what we find inside a toaster. We just have some exposed wires that surround a slice of bread and the heat of the wire is enough to toast the bread. After a short duration, the power is cut and the heat stops nearly instantly. But the heat doesn't travel too far. We really need it close to the bread for this to work. So instead, we can couple this with a fan and this allows us to force air over the heating element. As the air passes over the heating element, it will pick up this heat, and so we can project this heat 
into a room. The heat travels much further with this method. Now, the problem with this design is that if anything physically touches across the heating element or between the heating element and ground, we get a short circuit which will trip the breaker or even damage the device. But we can enclose the heating element like within this kettle, where the element is submerged in water. With these devices, the wire is wrapped into a coil and then surrounded by a powder, typically magnesium oxide, and then this is enclosed within a stainless steel case. Now, when the wire is heated, the heat transfers through the magnesium oxide and then through the tube wall and into the water, which prevents the water from creating a short circuit. With all of these methods, the heating element has a small surface area. So to transfer sufficient thermal energy, we need the heating element to reach very high temperatures. However, with underfloor electric heating, the surface area is very large as it covers most of the room. So the surface temperature is much lower and the heat is distributed evenly across the entire room. Ordinarily, we might find a forced air heating vent or a single radiator on one of the walls, which is either electric, hot water or steam heated. This will be a high temperature as it has a relatively small surface area. Hot air rises, so this leads to poor thermal distribution and also poor thermal comfort within the room. Compare this to underfloor heating and we see it's more evenly distributed. We can have either total underfloor heating or we can combine this with an additional heat source for those extremely cold winter days. If we look at a simple bathroom installation, the system is relatively simple. We just have the heating cable installed across the floor and this is connected to the wall mounted thermostat. We also have a temperature sensor connected from the thermostat and running down to the floor also. This is then all covered in an adhesive and then tiled over. The thermostat is connected to the mains power supply. When it detects that the floor temperature is lower than desired, it allows electricity to flow through the wire which heats up the floor. The cable just has two heating elements inside. These might be solid core wires or multiple strands. This will be covered in an insulation and with a thin metal protective screening and then coated with a PVC outer layer. We also find electric heating cables used for frost protection, typically along an external pipe which has the risk of freezing. The cable is installed along the pipe and fittings and is usually then insulated. Temperature sensors and thermostats will then monitor the pipes and ensure the fluid within the pipe stays above the freezing point, as this will otherwise damage the pipes. Additionally, we can use the heating cables to ensure a fluid in a pipe remains a certain temperature as it travels between various production points, for example, food production or pharmaceuticals. Even if pipes were insulated, some heat will escape, and over a long distance, this can cool the product too much. So electric heating ensures it's always the correct temperature. We might also find them used on rooftops to prevent snow building up, because when snow falls, it can add huge amounts of weight to a building structure. So we can automate this clearing process by using electric heating. We might also find self-regulating heating cables, especially in process engineering applications. This again has two heating elements running along the entire length but these are encased within a conductive core. The core will expand and contract microscopic amounts as its temperature changes. When the cable or part of the cable is cooled, the material contracts, and this makes it easier for an electrical current to flow from one cable to the other, and this generates heat. As the temperature increases, the material expands, and this makes it harder and harder for current to flow across to the other cable and so less heat will be produced. This allows the cable to self-regulate its temperature and keep a fluid within a pipe at a specified temperature. Check out one of the videos on screen now to continue learning about electrical engineering and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram and theengineeringmindset.com.